Welcome travelers. I'm Josh. I'm Glenn. And I'm Lee Wanika. And this is Tabletop Journeys, where we will be your not-so-humble guides on the quest for RPG adventures. Here at Tabletop Journeys, we are all devoted role players and storytellers at heart, and we absolutely love sharing our passion with you. On our show, we feature diverse tabletop RPG systems, demonstrating them through actual plays and breaking down the rules to provide you with tips, tools, and techniques to help you navigate them. We also love bringing the content creators behind these games into the studio to give you a peek behind the curtain with relevant and insightful interviews. Let us help you get the most out of your story, no matter what game world or system you're playing. Because detailed settings, heroic characters, diverse NPCs, and a focus on story over rules can make any campaign legendary. Now, here's a message from friends of the show. In a world headed for disaster, five strangers with mysterious pasts are thrown together by the winds of fate to try to stop the unseen forces that threaten to destroy their world. Join Creval, a dragonborn with no memory and no past, who is the first of the barbarians of the mountains to be seen in a thousand years. Cotter, a penniless paladin, running from something or someone in his past. No one, the only tiefling monk the kingdom has ever seen, who has been expelled from his monastery for reasons he has not revealed. Adri, his monastic companion who hides some deep dark secret she cannot reveal. And Arlen, once a simple farmer, until some mysterious event manifested sorcerous powers in him. They must travel the length and breadth of the kingdom of Faro, searching for the disparate clues that will help them unravel the mystery of the failing of their land, while trying to hold together the unraveling threads of society's weave threatening to come apart at any moment. They will have to battle nature, plague, politics, and even the forces of the underworld as they attempt to discover and defeat whoever, or whatever, is attempting to poison their world and throw it into chaos. Relic of the Past is a novel-length story told via a clean, custom, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons game. Find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever fine podcasts are found, and at poolmedia.podbean.com. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's episode. Excited to be talking a little bit more about Faye. Uh, Join tonight uh, with my illustrious friends and co-hosts, uh, Mr. Lewanika Miller, Mr. Glenn Myers. Gentlemen, how the hell are you? Is it as hot in Connecticut as it is in Maine right now? Because, good God. I can say, from my experience, sitting in my home office bedroom all day at my day job, <laughs> Basically, going out into the kitchen to grab food and come back to my home office bedroom when I'm doing TTJ stuff. It must be excruciating outside because my poor six year old, seven year old air conditioner is barely hanging on. I do have to close my door. So it is fighting this beast all on its own. Our newer air conditioner, which is nice, takes care of the main part of the house. That's working like a charm, keeps the rest of the house cool. But I am barely keeping the humidity down. Didn't do sugar for the temperature today, <laughs> Good catch, but at yeah. least it kept the humidity uh, down. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's fighting against all so, the hot air in there right now, Lewinika, so I can understand why the air conditioner is struggling a little bit. That's uh, I was going to uh, say you know, all the lights shining on my beautiful yeah, face, but yeah. we can go yeah. with hot air. Yeah, the, know, the fans know what's actually going on. Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm here all week, try the veal. How about you, yeah. Glenn? How are you doing, sir? How are things? Uh, so is this the first summer in the RV, or is this? Second. Second, this okay. Is, this All is right. our second summer in the RV. And yeah, we're a little bit more temperature sensitive, even with the AC running. And it's been hot as hell for the last week or so. Yeah. But tonight is the first night, the first evening that the humidity is finally broken and sitting outside, not yeah. even after sunset, but pre sunset in the like six, seven o'clock hour was pleasant and nice. Uh, very much enjoyed 
an afternoon sitting in front of the RV playing some days gone on the outside TV. Nice. Nice. nice yeah. Nice. It's been weird up here where it's like, Super hot during the day. And then at night, we have been getting like crazy thunderstorms. Like the thunderstorms up here are not uncommon in the summer, but but they've been really like nuts for the last couple of weeks. And so I am I am glad at least that uh, that things seem to have, uh, I don't know, abated on that front anyway. Yeah. A little so, bit. Josh, uh, yeah. I just want you to make sure you channel those thunderstorms because based on what we ha- did – and set up last week for Kraken Week, I yeah. think we need to have some kind of environmental encounter and really draw on some of the torrentialness and all the and, and the look and feel so we can put that into our adventure as into well. Into an, 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 an underwater uh, an adventure? You want me to make sure I, I channel thunderstorms underneath the water? No, for the part where they're getting to the spot where they go down. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, fair. Yeah, the, yeah. That, yeah. I suppose we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, and if you haven't checked out that video, go to our YouTube channel and see that. It's a good time. It was really exciting to sit down and feel creative. We've been we've been working on the Kickstarter projects for a while now, and sometimes in the morass of getting that done, it's nice to get some new energy and some new juice in there. So that's a, so that's been an awful lot of fun. But so yeah, so go to make sure to check out our YouTube channel and watch the video that we did for Project Kraken. Anyway, without any further ado, gentlemen, let's go ahead and get into Faye. Lately on the channel, the last couple of weeks, we've aired the actual play that we did with Jay and the updated so rule set. Yeah, so much fun. First of all, that's right off the top. This is the second time that we've had the opportunity to go ahead and play Faye with Jay. And there is something about the game system that pulls a very specific role play aesthetic out of the three of us. And I'm not quite sure what, so maybe that's where we're going to start tonight is talking about. Like, so like, why is it that, because uh, the first time around we were playing monsters the first time around. So that maybe that explains why those characters were a little bit darker, a little bit more, a little bit edgier, maybe something like that. But this time around we were ostensibly playing mortals who for various reasons, had interactions with the Fae, but they were still dark and edgy and a little, a little broken. So, what, what gives there? Like, why? What is it about this game you think that kind of pulls that out? And why would that be fun for somebody that wants to play a game or a character like that? So, first question. I have thoughts, but I want Glenn to go first because I have an interesting thought, but I want to hear what Glenn's yeah. got to say on it. Just right at the beginning when he first pitched the game to us and we were looking at Faye in its first incarnation before I got to play Puddin' the Troll, Jay talked about it from the perspective of this isn't a nice, friendly, you're the hero game. You're playing the monsters. And as monsters, you do not necessarily nice things. Right. Like That was straight up front in the pitch. So going in, I already knew it was going to be a little bit edgy. We brought some campiness to that edge in the first game that we didn't bring as much in the second game, I didn't feel, that kind of softened it. I personally think that Puddin was a much lighter character than Raman was. Raman was a dark and troubled soul. Puddin was a happy-go-lucky troll who just wanted to eat you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, And I noticed that in the recording, there was some... Ramen needs some cookies and a, a, a black leather couch and a nice glass of water and to speak with somebody because Ramen's seen some things, man. Like he's, Dude, he's, yeah. he's rough. It's the way Jay wrote him. And I just filled in the blanks. Like he didn't say that all the people that were kept as slaves in the fair realm were named after food, but I was a slave in the fair realm, never met anybody from the mortal realm and my name was ramen so i just filled in the blanks from there and that created a pretty dark and and because it did straight up say that if you didn't work hard enough they ate you yeah uh, yeah yeah so that, that that created a pretty dark and tortured soul no matter what growing up from birth in that kind of environment and then just yeah. escaping to the mortal realm for a year or so it wasn't a whole yeah i feel pretty much what you feel on that glenn we got when we first played Two years ago, we got all the information we needed on the title card. 
And then we got these amazingly well thought out pre-generated characters. There's an art form to giving good pre-generated characters that not only work for your game, but work so good you still want to play that character afterwards. You almost have a hard time writing your own character that would be as good as the pre-gen. That's how I felt about what I was given when I played the Malgway. It's exactly how I feel about Krieg. It was just a brilliant character. I love what I was given to start with. And then the interplay that we did in both games together just took it to a whole new level for me. This is the character I wanted. Definitely the kind of character that that I would have played or I wanted to play later on. Or I might want to do precursor missions. If this is how they ended, it would be fun to do missions before this, like the, the preview. Or maybe there's some fae bullshittery that goes on so now there's <laughs> like back in time and maybe we all got a view of what could happen to us mm. without any of the details but we know we might die in a fiery plume so now we have to adventure with right. that hanging over us i think Ooh, that kind really, of like a, really like, like a captain pike knows how he's gonna die kind of situation yes. Say, pike, yeah. yes yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly yeah. but mm-hmm. to yeah. your point glenn we brought a level of camp which simply comes from the fact we're in a mall and we're all 80s kids, right? And we know and what little brown life ass like. Mogwai is going, Bikini! I just love pop culture references that fit the scenery. And that's what we sure. did in one fashion or another. You know, no, absolutely. W- whether it was mentioning, oh, I'm taking the mannequin from Hot Topic or all that. We just started naming off mall stores. Some of these stores we were talking about probably aren't even in malls today, the 14 that are left. And it was like, right. but we did that. And with this game, we didn't have all that, but we had a, a spate of great characters. Mm. And we had a good mission that was really just a brilliantly contrived and set up dungeon crawl. And, and, and we had a reason to be there. We had a way to be there. The adventure was constructed in a way that gave us time to work into our characters before we got to the dungeon draw. Driving in the RV on the way to, to the spot, we got some good character development in there to give us an idea of what we wanted to do to play off of each other. Honestly, I was... Krieg was ill-formed in my head, other than I wanted to be a bit of a crackpot coop that saw some things and nobody believed him. I knew that going in, but everything else about the character I played was formed really in that RV trip. And the first bit of the scene where we're going down the stairs, Yeah, I think the moment I refer to you as top and then you called me out on it. And I said, and then I'll call you Griff or I started every, and I started coming up with all these names, even to the point where the GM started forgetting what was the character's real name. Yeah, That was all character traits that I formed because I'm like, I need to play the older guy. Josh is going to play the leader. You're going to play the, the the novice who's new to our world, but dealing with stuff. That puts me in a situation where somebody has to be a bit of that comic relief. And the best way I know how to do that in a deeply dramatic yeah. and horror type story is through pop culture references. And so yeah. what I chose is, What's a redneck kook going to know a lot about? Sports. So I just start naming off all the little the roided out sports stars I could think of and <laughs> making those type of references. It was all because of role play. I think that's really where the fun that you're talking about, Jess, comes from. It's yeah. great base characters and a GM who set up a, a, a content creator who set up an amazing storyline that gives room to breathe so people work into their characters before they actually get to the adventure yeah. itself. It is almost like he did a create a collaborative world building exercise without actually having a table and dice. Yes. Let me bring you all to the well site where my friend Bacon died on the road. And right. Right. And when- right. I would have, and I, I got to say that we, even though I guess maybe we should have seen it coming, and I didn't really put my finger on it then, but looking back, our characters and their backstories definitely already had like a Suicide Squad vibe going on. Oh, sure. Yes. Let me build on that for just a second there, Lewinika, because so you're right. I think that scene in the RV, like you said, like it was collaborative world building without all the without the roll tables and dice because we were just yes anding off of one another. We were building our cadre Indeed. and building our characters and who they were. Wow. And what they wanted to do, 
while we were playing the game. Because Deacon Martin was a lot of things. The comic relief, he was not. And I, I commented about this in the recording about how similar uh, in kind of the brain space Deacon Martin was to the character that I played in Big Adventure Game. Just the, the last AP that we had done just before that, where mm-hmm. it's like the zealotous, going to take control, doesn't trust the things that he is zealot, right? Because that's the whole, that was Deacon's whole shtick is that he, you know, he was secretly aligned with the Fae and bringing them something to go ahead and help. The resource that he was bringing the explosives to on the other side was not mortal. He was another Fae. So, like that was the whole, that was the whole shtick from the beginning. So, but Deacon himself is also deeply untrustworthy of the Fae, of, of every other Fae except for the one that he's in league to, basically, right? That's that's the only good Fae. Every other Fae is worthy of disdain and destruction sort of things. Uh, so yeah, so he was a lot of things, but the comic relief, he was not. I, I loved that both of you guys were able to bring that a little bit, uh, much to Deacon's uh, chagrin, where it's like, you're not taking this very seriously, clearly, but you're having your own little banter, so whatever. You can have your your banter over there. I know where my bread is buttered, and it's not here, kind of things. All over the walls of the bunker. Exactly. Yeah, right, yeah, it, right it, now, it, my, my it bread is buttered. buttered in about a 20 by 20 square. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's whipped and exceptionally soft. Ooh, <laughs> evenly spread. <laughs> yeah, evenly yeah. spread. <laughs> Fine buttery I, mist. <laughs> yeah. I love the fact that some games can provide that big adventure game allows that, that breadth of opportunity for character growth. I love the fact that Alex Vigna and Jay Moore and our second time with an actual play with Jay. Both of them actually, oh, I guess we didn't actually play didn't with, Alex actual play with, with Alex yeah, yeah. the first time, but I love the fact that they are able to create those opportunities for character to grow. I think we do a lot about DM and GM and storyteller t- tips and tools. Our actual plays, even the ones we are not running, many of them, if not all of them, are also a tip and tool. And certainly for content creators that are building their own games, your game system can be wonderful. That first adventure that people play you got to give them the room to build the character. you got to give them room to move. Somebody can look at the page and know who the character is, and yet they can still make it their own. So when I play Krieg, that is going to be very different than six months from now when Jay is running this at a convention and somebody else is playing Krieg. I look forward to the time where I'm sitting at a table next to him while he's running in a session so I can just listen in and see how these same characters get played by other people. I think that will be very cool that would be very interesting and if he's running this scenario i would love to be a fly on the wall when other people get that opportunity to build that camaraderie in that opening scene when you can build good openings for or opportunities for growth that's where great games are made if you can do that in your starter adventure or in your convention experience you're killing it. If you're a GM who wants to go to your local store and say, hey, look, I got a starter adventure in this set just to see if you guys know how to play it. Come sit and play with me this one time. And if you really like it, we can set up something permanent. Make sure you do that. Make sure you give them characters that have room to grow and you have a story that gives them that ability, that time to connect. Yeah. That very nicely brought me up to my second point that I wanted to go ahead and bring up today. And that was kind how neatly the system translated to three old guys who play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and play a lot of like crunchier games. This is not rules light, but it is rules simple. The mechanic is pretty straightforward and the ability to adjudicate all your challenges by basically either rolling against the environment, i.e. just making like a skill check or, or an ability check, right? Or, you're making an opposed role, so you're rolling against somebody else's. That translated really well, and I think that in general, the way the rules are now, and I know that we were seeing kind of a precursor of kind of the next in- incarnation of Fae, but I thought that differently from the first time that we ran it, I thought the rules were a lot smoother and a lot more intuitive this time. I think that there were there were some things that were that Jay maybe was working was workshopping the first time around. I'm thinking about like 
like grapple checks and stuff like that. So things that kind of were a little kludgy to begin with, that was very smooth this time around. Although I am still surprised by the sheer amount of damage that weaponry does. That's still way over the top in a fun kind of way. But the amount of damage that like a gun does in, in Fey is disproportional. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It, um, it wrecks stuff. It does, yeah. But I thought that, that was a lot better this time around. I thought the rules felt smoother and they translated easier to the table for me. I would definitely agree. The rules were a whole lot easier to digest and the playthrough was smooth and dynamic. The one thing I would say in terms of the damage scale is while the guns do a ridiculous amount of damage, they also don't get as many opportunities to hit. And it's a lot, and it seemed like it was a lot harder for you to hit. Whereas That's Raman, fair too. Yeah. when he's going nuts yeah. with his baseball bat, I got as many swings as I had as my speed or something like that. So in yeah. the end, I was rolling multiple times to hit and around instead of just once. So a lot of times Deacon would take that shot and then it, that was it. That's what he had. But yeah, that's what he had. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but combat for in melee, it felt powerful, even though it was smaller damage dice, just because as opposed to being a, you have two attacks or one attack or etc., And as much of a back and forth, it's like monster of the week where you're taking your combat round. And instead of saying, these are the two small things that I did, you're just giving a general description of how you move through those few seconds in time. And you might've got five or six hit off on six hits off with your baseball bat or knocked down more than one opponent. But it's, it was less about making sure that all of the movement was precise and less of a simulation and more of a narrative combat. Ish. Not full on narrative like monster of the week, but again, rules friendly, not quite light, but yeah, yeah. R- rules. That, the term I've got is like rules simple. It's not rules light. It's not like a PBTA where there's a really no mechanics at all. That kind of, and it's, very narrative and it's not D D or pathfinder or whatever where it's like everything is structured down to the die type and the, the everything like that but it's kind of like there are some guidelines and as long as you stay within the guidelines and then just keep rolling dice you're going to be okay yeah uh, and yeah, i much. think glenn, i think glenn you made the great point it's i never felt that because josh quote unquote played the wizard with his gun that did the big fireball right um uh, <laughs> vastly outpowered me because he would get that one or he got a couple of those shots off and did massive amounts of damage. But I, as a primarily melee individual, and even though I did have some range stuff was able to get in there and mix it up. And I was able to be successful and do things. I was able to use some of my other abilities and actively use my equipment, like setting the trap, which wounded and did things and impacted the encounters greatly it was awesome that all of our abilities were able to come into play throughout the course of this adventure i don't know about the two of you but i didn't i don't think i left anything on the deck i used pretty much everything i had at some point during that encounter and that again speaks to the amazing construction of the pre-generated character and the quality of the actual starter adventure that we played. It was written specifically for tabletop journeys and our actual play. And I have been in talks with Jay afterwards saying, you got to keep this mission together. This was really good. This was a great showcase for what you're talking about. So I look forward to seeing it in its later iterations and final iteration yeah. because i think it'd be awesome and i would play it again this was no, just amazing so much it was fun. clear it was very clear that jay put a lot of work into the balance of the encounter and making sure that the skills were balanced across the four available characters much to our chagrin we only had three players so we didn't have the mm-hmm. one guy who could heal but Oopsie. very much so like even my secondary skills were on point and used throughout the game and yeah. It really just, yeah, it was a straightforward mission, but that's not anything to knock because of how well balanced it was and how it utilized everything that all the characters had and how well everybody was designed to fit together and be able to move through it. It was a lot of fun. And yeah, I think, I think, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and let's not 
cast shade on the quality of the NPCs involved, the personality that Jay put into the individual boogies, like the ones that actually had speaking roles were definitively different NPCs. A bunch of them were whatever the stock boogie may have been, but each of them he ro- he role played with a unique personality perspective based on the scene and the snare that was happening, whether they were afraid, whether they were bold, whether they were angry, whether they had given up and said, I'm just going for it or whatever. It was all yeah. well done. And then the two big speaking ones, Raman's Tormentor and then Copper the Pot. lead yeah. uh, and then Copperpot themselves, the two big NPCs. Who got away. They were amazing. Yeah. I don't know that Copperpot amazing. got away. Wait a minute. I don't hold think on. he got away. I don't think he Actually, got away. I think he was caught. He got away from me at he the time. The You're right. He, he was caught in the blast. Unless total, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but I just love the fact that those characters were so evocative. Like I had such disdain for Copperpot that it was. Yeah. I was fully in character, and I was like. Damn the brakes! I will blow myself up if I get that. Some, <laughs> yeah, it was. Th- I was like, whatever. Yeah. Hey, I, that's how I was feeling about those characters. It was like this guy doesn't walk out of here in one piece. Yeah. That I can yeah. tell you, and that again, exceptionally well crafted characters, exceptionally well role played NPCs, and yeah. I think that's probably where Josh will lean into Jay as a GM and how he runs the game. It's it's almost like you're reading my notes here, Lee Winnie, because that was the next thing that I was going to say is that just not really anything about the system itself, but certainly talking about the way that Jay ran this time. I, I think maybe this is probably a joint statement based on both the cleanup of the rules that we've seen since the first time around, but also the fact that Jay has been running Faye for two straight years he's been running this and, and at conventions and everything like that. He ran a much better game this time around. And I think that that's so uh, the, I think really the only thing I want to go ahead and say about that is that if you have the opportunity to play at one of Jay's tables and play Faye with him, take it because he's the stories that he's able to weave exactly what you were talking about. Like the way that he was able to create diverse NPCs, even though we really didn't interact, I think it was what maybe five NPCs that we interacted with the entire time, but the way that they they all felt distinct, and and then his copper pot was despicable. Like he was like, and, was and not villain. even to mention not even to mention Puddin's tormentor. Like when we met them, the way that and Glenn, your ability to play off of that to go ahead and be like oh wait no now i know who this is now i know what's going on it created this entire pall over the entire encounter so you've got three characters with very different kind of motivations right raman's trying to survive deacon's trying to go ahead and do something nefarious and krieg is trying to go ahead and get the job done he's kind of that very like business-minded military mind and all of a sudden Raman is being taken out of contention basically because of the PTSD that he's experiencing. And now it's, at least for me, I won't speak for you, Lewanika, but for me, it was like, Oh, what do I do now? Oh crap. Like the third leg of the stool is gone and the stool's fallen over. What am I going to do? And so it was a brilliant move on Jay's part to go ahead and trot that out. I thought to go ahead and, try to wedge in between the three of us because the three of us were rolling through that map once we figured out the synergy of our abilities and everything like that like there wasn't nothing stopping us like we were going to make it to the end and so i think that jay needed to go ahead and do something like that and then did and it was the perfect stroke to go ahead and separate us a little bit. this is a perfect opportunity for me again to call out the gm tip and technique that was displayed by jay here once you have a good adventure once you have good base characters and you go to role play them as a GM, you have to watch what's happening, watch the interactions and find ways to one, create differentiation between the minions minions, unless you're got a group of robotic automatons can't feel like robotic automatons. And even then I question whether they should, 
right? One should seem somehow more menacing. Maybe it's a head tilt so you get that Darth Vader emotion where the mask could not show emotion or, or whatever. But you should be doing things in a way that give the players different feelings about each of the minions and the one they're fighting. You should make a player want to take out that one minion more than any other minion unless – one of their friends is in jeopardy and then you're creating a dramatic choice for one of the other players based on what this one player is doing. That's how I felt about the way he dropped in Raman's tormentor and the other things that were going on when Krieg was down to one hit point, one of the 14, 15 times he may have been down that low and Raman had to make the choice of taking out one bad guy or saving his friend. That's a dramatic choice. It was created yeah. because we got the scene in the beginning we had good characters that had that differentiation and there was a dramatic choice it's not like you're against five goblins goblin number one is doing this goblin number two is doing that it was the goblin that just clobbered your friend is standing over him getting ready for another attack and your your tormentor is down at the end of the hall what do you do and a choice had to be made Josh had a choice at one point of taking the shot or doing something else. And it's like, no, I'm taking that shot. Those are dramatic choices that yeah. only work if the GM differentiates those NPCs and gives them something interesting in the way he describes their actions. So that's the takeaway for storytellers out there. When you're at the table, describe those actions dramatically, give players a reason to want to do a thing and then give them a reason to be conflicted with, another goal then watch the game take place and that's where magic happens all right we're going to take a quick break there to uh, hit up the middle of the show and pay some bills here but we'll be right back uh, talking more about our actual play of Faye with jay morris welcome to the middle of the show we wanted to take a minute and thank the people who helped make this show possible, our Patreon supporters. We like to shout out our adventurer-level Patreons, so extra big thanks to Tim Morris, Joe Harney, Dave Rideout, Adam Scaramella, and Marty Napier. Patreon supporters get exclusive content, free copies of all of our published and unpublished game supplements, early access to episodes, and free invitations to our monthly games. You can learn more at www.patreon.com slash ttjourneys Speaking of published material have you checked out the supplements we have on DM's Guild? We have two full books The Traveler's Guide to Collaborative World Building The Traveler's Guide to the Multiverse and you can combine it with all of our supplements to make your next role legendary Go to www.ttjourneys.com slash DM's Guild for more information if you're looking for Tabletop Journeys swag or need a fantastic set of new dice, then you should check out the Tabletop Journeys Spring Store and our affiliate, Fanroll Dice. You can make your first purchase through Fanroll at 10% off, and every purchase helps support the show. You can learn more about that at www.ttjourneys.com fanroll. And if you want to get some awesome t-shirts, hoodies, hats, or other gear, check out www.ttjourneys.com slash swag to get redirected to our spring store. These are the same vendors that we use for our add-ons when we do Kickstarters and stand by their products. But the best way you can support the show is by joining the conversation. Did you love one of the episodes? Did you disagree with something we said? Maybe you just want us to cover your favorite game system a little more or talk about a brand new system. Check us out at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash T-T Journeys. That's our link tree. And join the conversation. We hope you're enjoying this week's show. So here comes the second half. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to us. And if your platform lets you leave a comment or a rating, why not hit the button and show your support? Thanks again for listening. Now on with the show. All right, we are back. I threw out a couple of points here at the beginning of the show here, talking about uh, about how the actual play ran for me and what I thought. Uh, what are your overall thoughts? What are some takeaways that you had of the game? So I think my biggest takeaway from 
this particular encounter in Fey Mortals, which I mean, getting to preview the uh, yeah. up and coming, even though he doesn't even have it ready to even present for a Kickstarter yet, was fantastic. But that is coming, so keep an eye out for it. But honestly, we've talked about it already. We've talked about how well the characters were written. And I don't know how you two felt about your character, but I'm going to go into that a little bit more deeply. I talked about just automatically making some connections and, and filling in some blanks with adding on things like everybody was named after food, etc. But really what all that boiled down to, aside from those little quirks that I could bring in, like yelling, but what about Hot Pocket? Which was another way that I figured that I could bring a little bit of levity for to such a dark character also, sure. by yeah. the way. But really, it was the opportunity to sit down and play a character in what almost seemed like a scripted one-shot. It was a scripted one-shot, wasn't it? Designed to end the way that it did for Raman. Like, everything mm. about the whole thing felt right for him from start to finish. I actually got to play a character in one single one shot with a full character arc all the way to accepting his death to try to stop this from getting worse in a few hours. And it was fantastic. Normally to get that kind of development out of a character in terms of like mental shift, it takes multiple sessions, sometimes half a campaign, but because Raman started out as a PT sd riddled victim who happened to escape but then finds friends who show him that he can fight letting him find himself in the fight when he realized that he could fight back in the first time that we killed one and and just getting to the point where like, you guys seemed like you were going to let one of them live so he's like nope and full-on <laughs> negans him to, to just end him now none of these bastards are getting out of here alive with what they've done to me and my people it was very fulfilling to, to play Raman all the way through that arc, all the way to the point of saying, okay, I'm the only one left of my guys. I guess I'm taking them with me and blowing up the last of the explosives to just bring the whole place down. It was fantastic and wonderful. And whether or not he deliberately wrote it to be a one shot that ended in potential disaster or not, I think it's fantastic the way that it is. And Jay, if you do write this to become some kind of a commercial adventure or formalized adventure in the mortals book i strongly encourage you to keep and encourage the uh-oh we're all dead ending yeah. because that was fantastic i i love a very specific moment when you're Raman's tormentor had said something, and I don't remember the exact quote, but I distinctly remember, Glenn, you vocalizing or near vocalizing your indecision about what to do. And then Josh made the statement in character, and he said, Raman, remember what you're able to do. And I might be misquoting slightly, but you're stronger than they are. I love that moment. That moment yeah. was the whole bailiwick. So kudos to both of you for creating such a wonderful moment in scene based on what you were given and, and what you worked with. But again, I am at this stage of the, of the game. So fully in character, I at moments forgot who the heck Lee Wanika was. Sure, I was sure. really Krieg throughout this right. section of, of the game. And I was like, I think I had four hit points at that point, and I was like, <laughs> "You're getting beat up." Get yeah. it. That was a great scene, and it, it, it was it vocalized. Was so it was straight up like the guy that used to be his pet boss told him, "Yeah, get over here and kiss my boot." Effectively, and he like hesitated and took a step, and like he was automatically falling into that. And then, yeah, it was a great scene. So <laughs> I, I, I need you guys to understand the weight that I carry on my shoulders with what I'm about to go ahead and say, because, uh, and just bear with me on this is that Glenn, I'm so glad that you feel like Raman's journey was such a success and so complete for a three and a half hour or four hour session or whatever it was. You're right to be able to go ahead and take a one shot and really truly explore the five phases of a character's arc and really feel like it came to a satisfactory ending is fantastic. And 
Luminique, I appreciate when you're saying like you're in the drama and everything, and Ramen is indecisive, and Deacon using his, his charisma is able to go ahead and motivate. Mo- go ahead, you're you're better than they are, kind of thing. And I this with no glib and no joy in my voice at all. Deacon was always only out for number one. The only reason yeah. why he was trying to convince Ramen that Ramen, you're stronger. Than, so that way Ramen gets hit and Deacon doesn't. Like, oh yeah. So I so I appreciate that. Like that you feel like you were able to get some satisfactory. That moment meant something to Ramen, and that's all that matters. But just for me, I would be dishonest if I did not say, yeah, Deacon's so, motivation was not empowering you, my friend. So, that is not. No, no, I love it. I, I <laughs> love knowing that that's his full motivation because yeah. I yeah. knew that Deacon was not altruistic, but I, no. I didn't have a, a window into your mind, and that's that makes it even better. Yeah, cool. So, because Ramen was naive too, like very. Yeah, exactly. Naive. Oh, which Deacon absolutely was playing on. Like I, I yeah. hate to be that guy, but that's what he was doing. <laughs> so what that reminds me very much is the the latest iteration of Battlestar Galactica. And Josh, I've made the comment you would back in our LARP days, you'd have played a perfect Gaius Baltar. I I really got that vibe from Deacon off the rip. And I knew when you were saying that, and I'm pretty sure Krieg knew it ish yeah. in the moment. That was more of a Gaius Baltar, somebody saved my ass desire. But motivated Krieg in that moment was seeing Ramen rise up. Yeah. Seeing Ramen take rise up, regardless of why you said it, it was like this was this sure. weird situation where. You were playing volleyball, and I'm mixing all kinds of analogies here, but you said it, and Ramen spiked it, and I just got to sit there and say, and what? That yeah. was the, the I, moment. So it was more of a, an appreciation for what you did as a player and yeah. what, Glenn, you did as a player through your character yeah. that that created that amazing role-playing moment. And yeah. the three of us have had a ton of them over the years together and apart we've been a part of great scenes that have done wonderful things in our heads and this was just one of those moments and yeah i think glenn your deep dive into kind of the character and the arc was really well stated i would say krieg did not complete his arc in any way but i don't necessarily think krieg needed to i don't think krieg was a character who had quote unquote, the arc that needed to be traveled. I think of Krieg as being much more of the character actor character within this greater story. So while a prominent member of the cast, a prominent member of the team, he wasn't necessarily the focus. He was neither the leader who had a thing to do. He was not the young buck who does the thing. It's like watching the old SWAT. You had Hondo and then you had who was in charge and you had the young kid and then you had a bunch of other members of the team that were in SWAT and they all had good roles. Krieg was one of those other roles, right? Ulrich was the guy's last name, the actor's last name. I can't think of the the actor's first name. Skeet Ulrich's dad actually is who played (laughs) the original uh, lead character and that Colin Farrell played him in the movie or whatever, but he, the younger guy who had just joined the, joined the SWAT team. That's how I envision ramen, and I envision you being a cynical Hondo, probably more like Denzel Washington in Training Day than anything else. And I was just the guy up there to aid the banter, and I was fine with that. It was yeah. an absolute joy to be a part of that. Not so every me, character me, needs me, to have that full. It makes that sense arc. that it, it makes sense that you didn't feel like you had a full arc, and I would say that you already called that out earlier when you said that you think it would be great to play. Krieg's younger years, even if he knew the Captain Pike doom ending, whether he did or not. And it's because Krieg's character was at the end of his arc already. Yep. And you picked yes. him up at that point and gave him life. Yep. And that's why, because you loved the character so much and you played him so well, that's what left you with that void of, man, I'd like to play his younger years so you could have a piece of that arc. But yeah, you did great with Krieg. He was just an end of arc kind of character. Yeah. He was it's washed kind of like up. Ob- he was Ob- older. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. It, you know, we get to see you and McGregor play him at three different stages of his life in the movies. And then the Obi-Wan series, which was off the freaking hook. Right. And now 
Obi-Wan feels very complete to me as a character sure. because I got to see him at those various stages. But he was perfect for cool. what he was designed to do in A New Hope. Right. And his little snippets where he was a ghost and in some other series it might be a reminder or a flashback yeah, or whatever. It's a Christmas special. Also, also perfect. But honestly, it was – he needed to be in that spot at the end of the arc. And I thank you for illuminating that for me. Yeah. That's why I felt so good about it, even though there wasn't a full arc for him, because he was gone through that. And now the cool thing would be to get to play that yeah. earlier part of him. I, I love that the three of us can come away from this, from any role playing game experience with such different sort of takeaways, right? That always makes things like this fun because I don't, I think that Deacon was at the beginning of his like second arc of life. He, had an entire life before he did this, before he was in in thrall to cert and everything like that, and now he's beginning his next phase. Which means that that the tragedy which befell him at the end of the game, who knows what that does to his arc? Because that is kind of like his first. It's kind of like the first stop on his heroic journey. He, I don't know what happens to him next because right now, again, he's filling a thirty by thirty cube with with some fine particulates. Or perhaps he was thwarted at the beginning of his arc to become a villain. That's entirely possible too. So who knows? There's any number of he, things. He was definitely yeah. a yeah. shysty dude working both he sides. He could have gone in one of two ways. Right. Exactly. And But the other thing that I love is we have joked about this before about how like all three of us play basically the same character all the time. In any of our actual plays, we play the same character with subtle, like there are like little knobs that are turned and everything like that. But for the most part, we play very similar characters. Uh, if I think back to like when we did the real thing, right? I was basically playing myself from the mid nineties. Right? I think that there's a lot of connection between Puddin and Ramen to the character that you played, Glenn. I think that there's a lot of connection to Krieg to the character that you played, Lewinika, right? So, they and all that's came from within spanning. us, so I could, they I could all came from within us. Right? So uh, I'm thinking back to what else I was doing when we were playing this game. So here I am playing Deacon Marn. We had just played Big Adventure Game, where I played another Zealotus character. We had also just ran uh, Session 5 of Star Trek Preservations, where I got the fantastic scene with with Tobor and with Najar where I was playing Commander Janak and so they, there's that kind of character that kind of very much like manipulative like puppet string kind of pulley character right and on top of that Glenn we'd had the scene with Androsius and Zindrid in Streams of Spiro where mm. we were talking where we had that whole communication not that Androsius is necessarily a puppet master puller but there was a lot of kind of political intrigue and political kind of wrangling that had to happen in that episode to make the things happen that had to happen and so it's i'm looking at this there's just a lot of different influences that kind of went into this character and as a result i have no idea where he winds up because again like this was exploding everything in the way that was happened to go ahead and take out copper pot was absolutely unintended that was actually on some level a mistake that josh a player made when he tried to go ahead and do something that he thought was going to be very small. And again, because of the exploding, no pun intended, mechanic for how much damage that was going to do, that became a much bigger issue than I think Deacon understood it to be when he took the action that he took. So it's that's just an interesting observation that like the three of us came away from that final scene. Raman got a little bit, Raman very much saw like the end of his arc and went off into his fine red mist and triumph Krieg at the end of his journey, like inevitable fate sort of thing. And Deacon, I'm supposed to be doing this job and I just hit the detonator instead of, <laughs> I hit the detonator instead of not kind of thing. And so it's very much what happens now. I, I love that. And I love that, a, that a game like this, and I'm, I'm, as a callback to earlier in the episode, I love that a game like this, where the mechanics are so straightforward means that all of us can have this experience and the mechanics don't get in the way. It's, they're a little bit crunchier. 
than nothing, but they're not so crunchy that they had any way interfered with the game. It, the game felt very much like a Powered by the Apocalypse style game with a lot of narrative and a lot of really intense role play. And every once in a while, there was a little bit of mechanics that needed to be done to go ahead and, and spice it up or to decide how things were going to ma- manipulate or how things were going to move, which which uh, which dials were going to get turned, which levers were going to get flipped and stuff like that. And I love that. Uh, I absolutely agree. Won't add anything more to that because that would just be repetitious. And while I am known for that, I am not going to do that this time. Uh, as we are getting on in time, uh, I will say this. The other thing that I was very impressed by was a bit of yes anding that the two of you did, where very early on as we started into the dungeon delve part of the adventure, Glenn, you mentioned, oh, yeah, I did left, right, left, or whatever. And Josh – you just magically knew exactly how to reverse that because I edited that episode and y'all got it. <laughs> and and, we had a I, yes. <laughs> and I in game as the character and as Lee Wanika was sitting here trying to write it down, couldn't keep up with you. I'm like, <laughs> how in the actual uh, do, do you, like, and because in my head, when stuff like that happens in game, I as a GM will often say, oh, your characters would know I'm not even going to make you roll or something like that. But the two of you and Jay understood that and got it. And I'm like, and that, my friend, is why Simeon always goes left. <laughs> and right. I he cannot always figure always that right. out. Yeah. It, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, always left. Always left. Or whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. We went to, because we went. We, in the mission, we went always right. Yeah, he put his hand uh, on the right hand side, of, or maybe not. No, it was no, left. No, you're right. It was left. You're right. That's right. Because when we were on the first floor, like we wound up doing the first floor backwards because we went left instead of right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Correct. You're right. So correct. Uh, and and, yeah. and your the the spatial awareness of my two co-hosts and the GM for this adventure blew me away as a human being. I don't get it. That is not how my brain works. And it has never <laughs> been how it works. I am forever grateful that uh, an early co- uh, comic book I read as a teenager was Nightwing and flash. Uh, I read it and immediately shared it with Marty friend of the show. And who's a big Wally West flash fan. I'm a huge Dick Grayson Nightwing fan. And that, single one shot comic book dealt with their friendship and the fact that Nightwing beat Wally to the end of a maze because he did the left handed trick and Wally had to check out every single wrong way first when Wally came out and Dick was waiting for him. That was to me one of the greatest moments in comic book history. And it's so small unless you know that issue or you're me or Marty, it's significance in my life is not there, but that is why so, every character I have in every adventure I go, if there's a maze or if we're going to get lost, I always say go left is because of that comic book. And the fact that you guys did what you did just blew me away. I have two things on that. One, Trish and I still to this day in the woods say, do you want to go right or left on it? She says, let's go the Simeon method. And that we talk about it like Perfect. all the time. But the other is, do you realize that in this iconic story between Nightwing and Flash, but effectively that just means Nightwing was lucky. Yes, the maze had been on the, <laughs> if the exit had been on the other side of the maze. It could have taken him infinitely longer. He got lucky that he came to the the exit first. Yeah, okay. yeah. Even Nightwing has Batman plot armor sometimes, <laughs> and I'm not opposed to using that yeah. advantage. And, and you I mean, know, his logic really was his, sound, but he was just lucky that he found the exit on his before, side before yeah. having to go all the way around the entire thing to maybe ten feet to the right from where he first started before yeah. he found the exit. Yeah. The other I, thing that I find funny about that is he said it to Wally with such confidence that even Wally was second guessing himself. And I just love that. Yeah. Dick Grayson is a whole lot of things, but one of those things is when he wants to get like uh, holier than thou and uh, you know, I'm better than you. Like he does yeah. that. As well, if not better than Batman. I was gonna say he gets that from Batman. Yeah, and you know, so you learn that from the master. Yeah, yeah. Pro, pro trip. Now, don't look in the. I know that we're recording on camera, because we like to see each other. If you hold up your finger and thumb on your hands, the one on your left hand makes an L. So that's how no, I yours tell. Is, the yours is not team. making an L. Your right hand is making an L for me. No, so it's an L. No, that's not an L. That's backwards. Put up the other one. No, it's not. For me, it is. For me, that's an L. 
Oh, interesting. You guys see it reversed. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, we see so, yeah. so it yeah. on camera because I'm sitting across really from you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever, you know. In any case, yeah. The, if you ever get confused about left and right, that's one trick that you can go ahead and use. Like that's. Oh, I don't I, I get actually, confused about left left and right. <laughs> I get confused with remembering which came first as you yeah, yeah, just yeah, rattle yeah. them yeah. off. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Fair. So, Lunik, Glenn was talking about uh, about the character arc development. What do you got? Yeah. So I, you stole a bit of my thunder when you talked about if you, uh, I, yeah, it, it, if you get the opportunity to to see Jay out and or go to a convention or go to a local game store. If you see Faye being run and he runs this game at conventions all, all over new England, most of New York parts of Pennsylvania. He's been in New Jersey. He's all over the Northeast with this game at gaming conventions. If you're running a gaming convention, contact the show, look for Jay's contacts, ask him if that's something he can arrange and make your interest to do. I'm sure. He'd be happy to, if it fits in a schedule, if it's something he can do, make attendances and appearances. So I definitely would think that. But one of the other things I would say is the beauty of this game, any independent game, the, any game you want to run, whether it's independent or others, is all role-playing games need storytellers and GMs and DMs. And there are so many people on so many platforms asking for GMs that want to play live, want to play digitally, some mix of the both. If you're a player who's got a group and you don't have a GM, take the time to whatever game system your group wants to play. If it happens to be Faye, awesome. If it happens to be uh, D&D, cool. Whatever it is you want to play. If it's STA, amazing. Don't hesitate to grab a good starter adventure and run that game uh, as a one shot. Don't hesitate to step in if somebody else is running a lot, but they're having stuff, life stuff, so they can't run every single uh, session. Don't hesitate to say, hey, I'll run a one shot to fill in a gap for you. Don't hesitate to take that step. There are things about being a GM that can be challenging or difficult, but if you've got a group of friends that are already playing, they're going to give you the bandwidth to learn the game. Josh mentioned it earlier. This game ran smoother than the game to start with. We played Faye the first time as it was getting ready to go to Kickstarter when it was done, but it was not. Jay had been running it for a while and te play testing, but he does not have the experience. He did not have the experience then that he has now. And that's how it is when you GM. The first time is never going to be the best time. It's never going to be the easiest time. It gets better as you go, but you got to, you got to make that, you got to run that first game. So don't hesitate. Learn from games like this. Even if you're not playing the system, learn some from these techniques, how to make NPCs and minions interesting, how to make villains and banter, how to create open scenes for people to grow in their characters. Learn from that and run the game that you like to play. And I think Faye's a great place to start because it is real simple. It's got rules. It's got crunch for the folks that need to scratch that itch, but it's simple enough where you can also do what you need to do to just make the scenes move. So I think it's a great place to start. It's a great game to play. But even if you're not playing this game, you can learn a lot from this game and bring it to other games. Maybe you just like the tone of this game and you want to do it in a different system. There's that too. And if you like art, Jay's artwork is off the chain. Love the art for Faye. We didn't talk about it that much this time around. Uh, I know we did it in our first interview a couple of years ago with Jay, but the artwork, the comic book that this was based on, it's just brilliant. It's fantastic. It's really good and evocative artwork. So for those who just love the art of role-playing games, check this out. I totally agree. This is a system that is easy to pick up if you are familiar with role-playing games, you don't, the, the learning curve is not steep, which makes it nice. One last thing that I want to talk about tonight is to let all of you out there in our audience know that it is with much sorrow that I'm going to be stepping away from tabletop journeys. I have some things going on in my personal life that I need to attend to and a whole lot of kind of reconstruction going on, so to speak. The short version is I just don't have the bandwidth, honestly, to give Tabletop Journeys what it deserves, what you deserve as fans. 
I will still be around. I will be semi-active on the Facebook page. I will still be playing Lieutenant Camdrill Najjar on Star Trek Preservations. And I may collaborate on a project or two in the future. But it's been a great journey with all of you. And I hope you have many more across the tabletop. Glenn, you've been a huge part of what has made Tabletop Journeys what it is today over the last three and a half some odd years that we've been doing this. You came on at a time when Lee Wanika and I really needed a calm, steadying voice to keep us from spinning off into the ether, yelling at each other all the time. The, the contributions that you brought to the show and to all the projects that we've done away from the show have been huge. I appreciate what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, uh, and we're going to miss you, big guy. What you've meant for the show, what you've done for the show... I'm not going to be able to quantify in any reasonable amount of time. And I promised earlier I wasn't going to go long on something, so I will not do that here. But I will say that it has been amazing sharing the mic with you for the last couple of years. You have brought great questions in our interviews. You've brought great viewpoints in our rules discussions, concept discussions, and uh, book reviews. And I feel that they are instrumental in the thought process that we've had thus far. While I'll miss you on the mic, I know that you doing the things you need to do is important. And I look forward to seeing those successes as well. And I'm right here for you ever and always. And I'm excited that you're going to be continuing to play Najar because uh, you kick ass playing Najar. So I'm glad that's going to be happening too. So. And you make it very hard for me to make good mysteries, so keep challenging me. <laughs> All right. So let's see here. What have we got coming up on the show next week? Preservations Episode 6 begins, which Preservation six, Episode 6 is the second part of uh, the story that began in Episode 5. It's not going to be the last part of the story that began in Episode 5, but that's a separate show altogether. But Episode 6 begins on Tuesday. And then on Friday, in the normal sh- show slot, we have... Another interview coming up with a game for called the Triangle Agency, a modern spy story. Uh, we're looking forward to actually recording that. We've been chasing the date a little bit here to go ahead and get that nailed down, uh, but they will be on the show next week. So uh, that is what's coming up on the channel. In, yeah. in addition to all of that, we encourage folks to check out our YouTube channel. Our podcast continues on all of our pod channels and uh, uh, stations, whatever podcatcher you currently catch us on. Josh has been doing a vlog for the last couple of months, periodically releasing episodes direct to YouTube, as well as I have begun On the Right Path, another vlog series detailing this crazy podcast life and my take on other elements of what we do, all done, all being shown on the Tabletop Journeys YouTube channel, On the Right Path airs twice a week. It's scheduled for Wednesdays and Saturdays. We look forward and encourage you, as always, to comment where you can comment. If you're catching us on YouTube, ask questions, join our Facebook community group, come see us. Yep, absolutely. All right, everybody, that's our episode. Uh, Short answer, as always, go check out Faye. Uh, And if you're ever at a convention with Jay, sit down at his table and play with him. So really worthwhile. All right, everyone. That's the show. So we'll uh, talk to you again next week when we bring on the Caleb and the uh, folks from the Triangle Agencies. Yeah. Until then, have a good night. Thank you. Good night, all. Later. Thank you for joining us. This has been Tabletop Journeys. We would love to hear your feedback on our show today. Join us at www.ttjourneys.com, where you can subscribe to the blog to leave comments and see all the content that we publish beyond the podcast. You can also stay in touch by subscribing to our Twitter, Tumblr, or Instagram at TT Journeys, joining our Facebook group, Tabletop Journeys, or by sending an email directly to podcast at ttjourneys.com. Our full episodes come out every week on Friday, and every Tuesday features actual play and gameplay showcase episodes. Looking for early access? You can support the show and get episodes before everyone else at www.patreon.com forward slash TT Journeys. Check it out today and see all the awesome benefits we bring to our supporters. Lastly, if you're listening to us on Stitcher, iTunes, Podchaser, Spotify, or Audible, you would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to the podcast on that platform. Thank you for listening and for being a part of our growing community. 
and we bid you fair tides, friends, for Legends Await.